Okay. Good morning, my name is Sorka McPhillips. I'm the Chief Executive of the Huntington's Disease Association, Northern Ireland. Today, we're joined by Professor Hugh Rickards, who's going to be talking on the themes of mood and behavior in Huntington's disease. Hugh, do you want to speak for a wee second and I'll take you some questions. Yeah, um, hi everybody. It's lovely to see so many people there. Hi, Ashley, special call out for Ashley. Um, and Zeely as well, I've seen you as well, hi. So um, I've been working in HD probably for about 30 years. It's mainly what I do. I'm also a trustee of the England and Wales Huntington's Association. And I think I probably now had about 20,000 patient contact hours in HD over the years, something like that. So I'm trying to speak from that rather than from a sort of heavy research background. It's mainly going to speak from experience more than anything else. So that's probably enough for me. I'll just take the questions. Okay, we've loads of questions and we could probably talk to you all day. So we'll get some, we'll get through as many of these as we can today. And as I said, anything that we can't get covered, follow up by email, okay? So firstly, okay. I know some people with Huntington's disease can self-harm and try to kill themselves. My mm -hmm. partner was given a predictive result about five years ago and has been very down since. Is this normal or should I be worried that he might actually hurt himself? So I guess- okay, Well, I guess- diagnosis, Yeah. The first thing I would say is, if he's been down for five years, that's a really long time to be down for, and that needs that needs assessing by somebody. I guess the first place to go would be your, are they called family practitioners in Northern Ireland, or a GP? Yeah, GP. Uh, to go, to go, for him to go to the GP and talk to see, you know, sometimes being down about things is quite normal, but sometimes that's the clinical depression that will need treating. I guess in relation to self-harm, Although self-harm and um, attempts to kill oneself do happen in Huntington's disease, um, they're not super, super common. Uh, and I guess the best thing to do with the person, if you're worried about that, is just to ask them directly and to say, you know, you could start with some questions like how, you know, just about how they're feeling generally, how they might, um, if they've been, I've noticed you've been feeling low. Do you want to go and talk to somebody about it? Maybe get some treatment. If you went to a GP and talked about feeling depression, you know, they would almost always say, you know, have you felt so low that you didn't want to carry on living or that you wanted to harm yourself? So that's a sort of standard GP question to ask a depressed person. Um, but there's nothing to stop you from asking yourself um, because there's no evidence at all that asking somebody might make, would make any self-harm more likely. So it's okay if you feel like you can and you feel confident and you're worried about that, it's okay to say to that person, look, I'm this is something I'm really worried about. It might not, you know, it might not be based on fact, but I just feel really worried about it. Is it some, had you thought, is it something you've been thinking about? So I think it's okay to have that conversation. There's not, it's not a risk to have that conversation. It's not going to make things worse. In fact, it might be helpful for them because they may say, oh no, I do feel that, but I hadn't even thought about that at all. Or they might say, God, I have thought about it quite a bit. I'm so glad you asked me because I didn't want to tell anybody yeah I guess openness about that and getting help and to say as well I suppose that there are help for the the partners and carers in those situations as well we've got mm -hmm. some local supports here for for carers of people with mental health for example so if you get in touch with us we can also direct you to some support services okay the next question is my husband refuses to go to doctor's appointments he agrees at first and then at the last minute won't leave the house. And this can be a real frustration for, for some of our carers as well. Is there anything you can do in those circumstances, Hugh? Um, well, yes, there are things you can do. I, I guess the first thing to say is you're not alone in that. That's a relatively common HD-like problem. And my, a lot of relatives I know will say that. And it's also sometimes... Um, non-HD people have the same thing, you know, they have a problem, they don't want to go and see the doctor. So it's not, it's not a pure HD problem. I guess it depends a little bit about what the nature of the current issues are, because it might be if the nature of the current issues aren't too bad or they're manageable day to day, then it's not worth going to the wire about, or as they say in the US, it's not worth taking it to the mat, you know, really wrestling it down. So you might decide, okay, this is not something I want to do something about straight away. However, if there are risks or difficulties or real problems, then there's nothing to stop you talking to health professionals and or other people about it. So in other words, um, if you went to a health professional, again, GP comes into the frame there first, first off, 
Um, they may not want to disclose to you details about the patient or things they might know, but there's nothing to stop you from telling them what your concerns are and sharing your concerns. And I always think it's always better to do that in writing as well. So, I mean, I commonly get letters from carers, partners who are saying, you know, my husband, wife won't come to see you. However, here is a list of all my concerns hmm. at what's going on. And so that puts me in a position, which I'm quite happy, happy about, well, I'm sort of obliged to take some action then. I've got to make a judgment about risk or danger or need for help. And if the person's written to me, I don't have to necessarily share with them details of the patient because of my duty of confidentiality. However, it, it does put an onus on me to act and do something about it. So I guess that's a pretty good way forward. Um, and you can also, if you're able to, you can talk to the GP about okay, what, what could we potentially do in this situation? Do you ever use technology, Hugh, for example, video calling with, with patients or, or carers rather than if somebody won't physically attend? Is oh, that I an see. Option? Oh, right now, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, before that never happened, on about March the 20th, that's fully available all the time. Mm -hmm. So right now, 80% of my consultations are by video, like secure, NHS secure video links. It's not hackable at all. Um, so most of my consultations are like that right now. So I only get people up to development. It has been, yeah. I'm slightly worried about it though, because I think sometimes patients and their spouses can seem very well sitting on the sofa having a video chat, and then it later turns out that there were a bunch of things they never told you. Mm. And it's quite finding that hard to work out at the minute. Um, so that's because it's new to me too. Yeah. So I'm just starting discover that maybe okay so a few options there why does hd cause so many changes in behavior i suppose you're talking about the physiological physiological impact of huntington's disease on the brain there my mum wasn't too bad mentally wise but my sister's personality has changed completely and she's really paranoid at times so it's quite a lot there so can you talk a little bit about what hd does to the brain okay yeah well well sure um gosh where to start i guess it's really important for people to realize that we don't have a physical brain and a mental brain we just have a brain and that our brains are designed to help us survive as a species and in order to survive we've got to really integrate all sorts of bits of information some of it's emotional some of it's threat related some of it's pleasure seeking uh, and to integrate that with action and movement. So very much our brains don't have a physical bit and a mental bit. They're very much a mental and physical intersection at all times. And interestingly, the bit in the brain that's sort of like the, the major station for all the mental and physical things to get together really is the bit that gets mo most damaged in HD. So you, you're talking about the striatum, I know it's a tacky term, but it's like the bit of the brain where all the mental and physical and emotional and cognitive stuff gets processed together. And I guess that probably explains why people with HD tend to get that whole range of mental and physical things, and indeed a bunch of things that are not readily describable as mental and physical. Hmm. Would also say that as, a, as institutions, we've let our patients down a lot in this respect because we've divided our services up into mental services and physical services and that bears no sort of resemblance to what's actually happening in brains and it's you know you think of um all the trouble that that causes like do i see a neurologist or a psychiatrist or a mental health social worker or a physical social worker and this sort of i say it's an institutional bias like other institutional biases I call it institutionalized dualism, this idea that, you know, the idea that we have a mental and a physical self that are entirely separate has sort of got itself ingrained in our culture. But our brains aren't like that. They're really mental and physical together. So that's why we get mental symptoms and physical symptoms. I guess the other question that's implied from what you said is like, why do some people get really more mental symptoms than others? And yeah, I, even within the same family, why are the symptoms the and presentations are different? Yeah, I, I guess the best we know about that is it's probably to do with two things. I think one, it's a lot to do with other genes. 
actually more than anything else, I think it's to do with other genes. So in other words, there may be genes that make you prone to paranoia, for instance, uh, but it also may be to do with different life experiences or different you know, experiences of trauma and response to trauma as a younger person. So I guess it's probably not the HD gene that makes some people more prone to, um, let's say, psychosis or paranoia than others. It's probably a bunch of other genes and different environments. Okay. Why does my wife lie so much about money? Okay, so this, I guess, is a new trade that started. Lie so much about money. It's only for the past few years. She will buy expensive presents for people and then lie about it. She asked me for money once because she said she lost her wallet with £200 in it, but I found her wallet in her bag and I think she had just spent the money and pretended she lost it. Um, I think she's been stealing from shops too, but I can't be sure. I find some random small things in the back of her wardrobe that just don't make any sense. Um, there's quite a lot there. Um, so um, hmm. is, is spending and, and changing of, of financial habits something that you've encountered with Huntington's disease before? Yeah, I guess, yeah, there's two elements to that question. The first question is, you know, might financial decision making or financial behaviours change hmm. as a result of HD? Um, and then the second question is, uh, what would lead a person to lie about hmm. it? Yeah. Well, I guess the second question is a little bit more easy to answer in just pure human terms. So I don't think people with HD are more prone to lying on the whole. Hmm. But I guess if you get yourself into a difficult situation one way or another, that you hadn't planned out very well, then I guess you might be somewhat more, we would, we'd all be somewhat more prone to lying about it uh, for the same reasons we all tell lies, you know, to save face, to cover up having to confess something. You know, so I guess the rationale for people telling lies with HD is the same rationale that we all have for telling lies. Mm -hmm. However, then that brings us back to the first question, which is, do people with HD uh, make different financial decisions or change their finance behaviors and I think they definitely do and it's for a bunch of reasons I guess they're mainly one group is to do with not being able to predict future scenarios so it's more like well I've seen something and I want it so I'm going to get it um, and of course we all feel like that don't we at different times um, and the bit that stops us is that we're able to imagine what the future consequences might be of that action. We say, well, I'll buy that, I'll buy that, I don't know, lovely hi-fi now or something. And then there's a bit of you that's saying, well, yeah, hang on, you really want that and it looks really shiny. However, you know, what's your wife gonna say? And is there enough money in the bank to pay for it? And what about the other things you might need to spend your money on? Mm -hmm. so, and, and, you know, it's over X, so I probably need to discuss it with the missus sort of thing. Um, and I guess it's those processes, that ability to play the play the tape forward into um, days or weeks or months beyond, that's impaired in HD. But I also think it's at least possible to think about the reasons that other people um, overspend or make rash financial decisions. Sometimes, particularly if they feel themselves in a difficult place and they're really stuck, sometimes buying something impulsively is a way of managing that anxiety and I think that's something that you know that's really common outside the HD world it's just the HD specific thing I think is uh, people inability to really predict future outcomes from their activity and also sometimes a sort of I want to do that thing now so I'm just going to do that thing now but that's I think that's part of it and getting stuck in habits of doing things okay yes yeah, so there's a few options there but Ultimately, Huntington's disease doesn't cause people to, to lie. I don't think so. It's the first time I've ever been asked that question. Um, and I can't think of a single reason. In fact, I would say probably H people with HD might be slightly less prone to lie. Because I think lying sort of implies that you're doing a bit of planning for the future and imagining <laughs> what the consequence of the lie is. So I, I haven't noticed... I, it's literally it's the first time I've ever thought about it but I haven't okay. noticed people telling lies much hardly at all actually okay my husband was always a very gentle man but the last few years he's been very irritable and angry I know it's the disease and not him but it makes me sad and afraid 
He has lashed out a couple of times, not exactly hit me directly, but he has hurt me when I've tried to help him. I'm afraid to tell anyone in case he's forced into a nursing home. Can you help? Okay. Wow. I mean, first thing is, that's a really tricky situation. And that sort of gets to the heart of HD in terms of if you're a carer or a spouse, is that um, I guess the phrase that I hear a lot in the clinic is, this isn't the man or woman I married. And I guess that's a really common sort of thing. It's almost everywhere in HD. Um, I guess there are things you can think about doing in that situation. And, and it puts a lot of onus on you as the carer, because probably the person with HD is going to find this really hard to reflect on. But it's really about thinking about the situations in which that might happen and thinking about, you know, are there patterns to this? And classically, the sorts of patterns that we tend to see are that the person will get irritable uh, if things are out of sync. In other words, uh, you say, well, supper's at six o'clock and... Uh, and supper turns up at five past six or even five to six, and that can be overwhelming. So people might find that difficult. I think people with HD find it difficult to understand emotional cues and the emotions of their, their partners in the way that they might have done before. And that's pretty hard to. So I guess social, social problems, in other words, understanding social interactions can cause irritability if, that's, if they struggle with that and also getting overloaded with information or changing from plan A to plan B really quickly. Now, I guess it's really counterintuitive because normally if you're in a relationship and the other person's getting cross and angry, you want to say that's their responsibility primarily. I mean, that's yeah. how we're normally taught, don't we? But in HD, it's sort of unfair, but, but the reality of it is it ends up falling back on the person who's the, uh, on the wrong end of the irritableness to go, okay, how best can I manage that? Um, which seems a bit unfair, but it's in most cases, it's the reality. You end, up, you end up managing it. And then of course, when you're managing your partner, having been a partner with them, that's a huge change. And I think there's grief in that interaction too. So you've got to, there's your own emotions to think about when you're going through it. Now, I know that's a, like a, two minute answer to an absolutely fundamental HD problem. You could have days talking about this. And I'm aware it sounds a bit sort of flippant just to list those things off when actually it's, it gets to the fundamentals of what human beings are. So I, I feel like I haven't really done that enough justice. Okay, but when we're follow up, we might look at some specific um, points around maybe de-escalation and things like that. That, that could okay. help or you know we could maybe look at some practical things as well but yeah I think it's a very common issue as, as you say mm -hmm. in your clinic but for us as well to have to deal with the change in relationships and the change in dynamic in relationships and that's it's a huge adjustment for people so it's really important for the carers as well to get as much support as they can because inevitably the journey is only going to get more difficult over time. Yeah I, I, I would say um, I've seen lots and lots of partners going through this process and um, I guess the biggest barrier to me, I've seen a bunch of people come out the other side of it and then uh, start a new and different and okay sort of relationship with their spouse later. And that's usually when the spouse rather than the person with HD, when the spouse is able to accept and go through at least partially that grieving process. And, once, and I think once they can do that, and they're allowed to, if you like, manage the person with HD with a different hat on. At that point, quite commonly things will really improve in a relationship, but it's a very rough and difficult process. Okay. How soon do you think you should ask to see a psychiatrist when you know you will get HD? So I suppose you're talking about predictive testing there. Um, and early interventions, maybe? Okay. Hmm. I think that depends a little bit. I mean, a lot of people, uh, if you're a psychiatrist or a neurologist, you, you may not see people unless there's a specific problem. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Hmm. I, I personally think it's good to uh, 
see somebody, a specialist, whatever they are, a psychiatrist or a neurologist or another person, it's good to see someone early because you can do some prepping and some thinking. Uh, whether the system will allow that um, is another matter. Um, I guess if you're feeling well and you're getting on with your life, a lot of people don't want to go and see professionals. And I sort of understand that. You just want to get on with things until there's a problem. Yeah, we might look to see if there's any resources for for post-predictive testing. And that's something we're hoping to develop here is, you know, when you've had the predictive test and you go home and you know that you're likely not going to get any symptoms for a number of years, mm. it's that intervening period of maybe what can you do to help prepare yourself or should you just ignore it and, and wait until you start to develop clear symptoms? I think that's really personal. And mm -hmm. I'm in a lucky position where I can offer that to people. And some people will take it up. They'll come and see me every year and we'll just have a conversation. We'll see what crops up. Could be anything. And some people will specifically say, I don't want to think about it till it, there's a thing I need, a particular thing I need to think about. Mm -hmm. Say there's another really good reason for staying involved, um, which is the opportunity to take part in research. And I know that's difficult in Northern Ireland right now. Yeah. That will always be the case. Uh, hopefully it won't always be the case. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's something that people can do. The other thing that you can do, you know, at that stage, I would say is become politically active because I think, you know, in two or three years, we're going to have um, therapies that could modify this disease that are licensed, but may have limited access to people. I think that's very, very likely to be the case in, let's say, 2023, 2024. So if you're a young person, you've got a positive test or you're a family member um, and you want to do something and get a bit of control, I guess get politically active is what I would say. And that's going to create work for you, Saoirse, probably, but mm. probably work you'd welcome. Okay. Say, start asking questions about who's going to pay for these drugs, who's going to give them. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's a huge, I would say, in the community at the moment, Although we're making steps towards waking up to this issue, I think our steps are far too slow at the moment. They're much too slow. And 2023, 2024, you know, with a fair wind, that might be when the Roche drug gets licensed for the first time. Yeah. Fair wind. Might, we don't know exactly how effective it's going to be. But don't um, anybody think that once it's licensed, you can wander down to your doctor and you can get hold of it that is not going to happen and it needs sort of people need to wake up to that and start doing things yeah we're having a, a political roundtable tomorrow with uh members of the stormont assembly and one of the objectives would be to establish a hunted in disease all-party group at the parliament and Fabulous. one of the aims and um, is one of the things that we've identified is the need to ensure access to any therapies that come down the line for people in northern Ireland. because often here in this part of the jurisdiction we're uh, we're left behind and you'll find in the past that, that patient advocates and the patients have had to fight really hard to get access to drugs that people in other in other parts of the UK would just ordinarily have access to so there's a huge piece of work to be done there and there's and a few more questions all, yeah sorry if, go on here if you get an all parliamentary group you'll be doing better than England so <laughs> I'll be a first go for it, <laughs> go for it. Uh, yeah fabulous um, can we ask about depression in people with Huntington's disease? Is it uh -huh. treated in the same way as it would be in the general population? Is, I mean, is it treatable or is it something that you're expected to live with forever? It's just part of the HD. Oh, gosh, it's absolutely treatable. Yes, in almost every case. I guess the first thing is you've got to make sure that it is depression and not something else. Because sometimes people with HD can become quite withdrawn, um, but it's through apathy, mm -hmm. commonly that they may not generate ideas about things that they want to do. So they can look really depressed sometimes, but if you ask them, how are you? They'll say, oh, I'm fine, thanks. But they just don't look like they're doing much. So I guess you've got to establish, first of all, that it is depression and not something else. In general, I think depression is treated quite similarly to what you call garden variety, everyday depression. I guess you might want to look for triggers because there may be HD specific triggers such as uh, adjusting to diagnoses or changed functional statuses, or maybe s very specific triggers like having a choking episode for the first time or having a relationship difficulty as a result of HD. So I guess those are the HD specific things. But in general, I would say 
the horrible thing about depression is it's one of the worst illnesses you can get. It's a horrible illness to get. Um, I've suffered it from it myself once or twice. Um, the good thing about it, as somebody told me at the time, is that it's treatable and in most cases it gets better. So, you know, it's a good news, bad news story, but at least the good news is, you know, we have good treatments for depression now. And in most cases, they'll get you recover from depression. Okay. There's a few other issues that people um, have asked for specific um, guidance on. One of them being um, the psycho psychological impact of chronic pain and, and the associated fatigue. Is there anything that can be done there, Hugh? Well, well, the issue of pain is a neglected one in the world of Huntington's disease. That's because I guess we don't have many pain specialists in our community. So we quite commonly the research community don't, doesn't look at things through the, through the lens of pain, if you like. And I think there is a significant minority of people with HD who have difficulty with pain. Sometimes that they don't feel a painful stimuli at all. Um, or sometimes that in the absence of stimuli, one of their limbs just really hurts a lot of the time and nobody can find out why. That is a really hard thing to treat and there's not a lot of research on it. Um, I guess most of the most of the guidelines for treating it are based on people like me talking to my colleagues and say, saying, oh, we've tried this and we've tried that and that seems to work a bit. Um, so, but that, I'm not to, that's not to diss that idea. That's not a bad way of sorting out problems, but it's not been extensive researched okay. um have i drifted off the question so should be. no no that's perfect i mean so there's no real there's no real expertise that's been garnered around chronic pain management and huntington's disease but really you're that's talking true. about a case-by-case -case approach and multidisciplinary uh, inputs so you absolutely. really want a number of people to be considering is it possible yeah. or maybe this is this is too difficult a question to answer is it, is it possible that it's a psychological issue rather than a the physiological issue that could be causing pain in HD? Well, I, suppose, I guess the first answer I would say, yes, of course it is, because people with HD are like the rest of us in that respect. Uh, but the other thing is it may be that the idea of physical and psychological doesn't really stack up too well in the context of HD. Yeah. It be something to do with central regulation of pain, which may have a combination of pure physical factors and psychological factors and you couldn't really separate them very effectively. Yeah and the other thing of course is that the pain might be unrelated to the Huntington's as well. Absolutely because pe yeah. people with HD can have other things like toothaches and belly aches that you know so you can't just I guess that's a danger you say well, somebody's got HD and they're in pain you say oh it's just the HD and it turns out you know they've got a rotten tooth or something like that and you yeah Okay. So it's really important to consider non-HD causes of pain. It's a, a tricky one here um, that, that we encounter quite often actually is where a parent is affected by Huntington's disease and they want to talk to their adult children about it but the adult children don't engage, they don't want to discuss Huntington's disease, maybe are in denial about their own risk but are quite secretive about it in the family. Um, how would you help somebody in that situation or if there's any advice you could give there? Okay, but so it's parents, they brought up the issue with their children, but they don't feel like their children are taking it on board. Yeah, we would have, we would see this quite a lot with an affected parent and their, and their partner, their carer. So trying to raise the issue of Huntington's disease with their adult children, explain to them maybe about their risk or the risk or the things they should consider maybe in family planning, whether or not to get tested, um, future care planning for the affected HD parent. So they just don't want to talk about and it. And they just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's difficult because I think, I think as a parent, probably you've got a responsibility to let your children, adult children know about risks. But you're talking, these adult children are individual adults in their own right. So I guess if they really don't want to hear it, um, unless there are other, I guess the only other reason for, you know, really pressing the point home is, is if they were, uh, you know, thinking of having families of their own, so they're effectively, you know, passing on the risk. Hmm. Really difficult to know what you could do in that situation. It's hard because there's no way of saying, well, if you don't take this seriously, I'm going to do something. It's hard to imagine what that something would be, isn't it? You can't, you can't make a person see something if they don't 
if they're not in the position where they can see it. So I don't know whether I've got a good answer to that question, except to say hard. It is very tricky. I mean, one of the things that we've suggested in the past is that we've given resources around Huntington's disease, um, you know, leaflets or information about the condition. And if it's a case of the person doesn't want to talk, that maybe if you leave them with them, um, that they might read it in their own time. Yeah. It's a huge stuff. thing and it's, it's, a scary, it's a scary thing for people to consider. And maybe by not talking about it, they're not facing up to it. You know, it's, it's just, it's really tricky particularly around the issues you say family planning and there's there's limited knowledge in Northern Ireland here about the likes of PGD. We held a session yesterday, which was great, but um, we're trying to promote um, awareness of the, you know, it's not, it's not for everybody, but to at least know that the possibility is there. And um, I, sort of, I sort of saw the other thing. I haven't seen, I haven't seen that much in my practice, actually, uh, the telling children and children not listening. It's been the one I've seen a few times is, we don't want to tell the children, the adult children, because it'll only cause them worry. Yeah. The more difficult one, because we know there have been legal cases where people have said to health professionals, you know, you were in error for not, when you knew about my mum or dad, you were in error for not telling me um, because you've exposed me to risk and you should have, uh, you should have breached confidentiality. But the courts have decided in two different directions on that in different places. Um, and I guess then you're, you're I usually try and use my art of persuasion to get the parents to talk to the children. But I, I don't feel right now that I can breach confidentiality because if there's no limit to the number of people you might talk to, cousins, nieces, nephews, fourth degree relatives, goodness knows where. It's, and it's hard to draw a line there. Impossible, in fact. Yeah. So all you can do is try and encourage the affected person to to be open and share the information with with the affected people or the potentially at risk people. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult challenge that to manage at both sides for the people who don't want to talk about. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of two sides of a similar coin, isn't it? Yeah, I think ultimately though, the more openness there is within families, the, the better. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree, and it may be that um, in the advent of the new era of disease modification, that's a great uh, incentive for openness, isn't it? I would th I would imagine. If yeah. you feel there's something you could really do to modify the disease, even though there are things you can do now with reproductive technology, um, but for yourself, if, if people felt there were things they could do for themselves, then um, it may lead to more openness. We'll see. Okay. Uh, one of the things we've been asked is, are there any help or are there any helps or, or tips in terms of preventing memory loss associated with Huntington's disease? anything you can do in terms of early intervention or prevention okay well i would say research wise there's very little that would point to us but if you get a bunch of hd experts in a conference sitting down a pub afterwards having a few pints and you ask them that question that like the real sort of people who know a lot and are very wise i know what they would say they would say they would say probably half an hour of moderately warming physical exercise every day you know no i'm not talking about going to the gym and pumping weights i'm talking half an hour of something that might just make you feel a bit warmer and not full-on sweating or anything but you know if you got out half an hour a day and i guess i think some form of mental activity as well so there's a bit of the use it or lose it thing there which applies to all of us as we get a little older um, so I would say, I would probably say that's good, but you don't want to get in a massive fight with somebody like every day, right? You have to do your crossword every day for half an hour and they don't want to do it at all. I wouldn't advise going down that route at all, but it's also about establishing habits because people with HD are often like routine. So you say, okay, every day we've got our half an hour walk. It's at 10 o'clock. We just do our half an hour walk at 10 o'clock because that's what we do at 10 o'clock. Um, just get a bit warm and every day you know we do a little bit of mental activity whatever that might be whatever suits the person so you're exercising the body and the brain uh-huh and i think i really in my heart although i can't prove it i think exercising the body probably does nice things to the brain <laughs> and in terms of exercises for the brain we're not necessarily talking about very academic focused things like crosswords totally. or Anything totally that's not. getting you to think, getting, getting you. So yeah. art, for example. Totally good. Art is good. 
word searches, whatever makes you happy, really. Okay, great. Um, what about sleep loss or um, insomnia, Hugh? Are there are pharmaceutical um, things you could use there or other kind of general tips? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a massive question right there. <laughs> that's a huge question. I don't even know where to start with that one. I guess the first, there's a few general things I would say. I guess in HD then the bits of nervous system involved with regulating sleep can actually uh, go uh, early in some cases. Certainly that's the evidence from the mice, the mice studies. It's hard to know for, for sure in humans. Uh, so there's an actual biological reason why you might not sleep well, but there's a whole bunch of other reasons too. Um, so you need your sleep assessing. For instance, some people get enough sleep, but just at the wrong times or really inconvenient times. And particularly if you haven't got a structure to your day, there's a tendency to get to sleep later and later and wake up later and later. So things just sort of slide as they do for all of us if we, for instance, go on holiday. I guess I'm slightly worried about meds for sleep. Sometimes you definitely need them. But particularly if you're not, if your balance isn't very good and you're ten, you have a tendency to get up at night, then you can imagine if you give something somebody something quite sedating to get them off to sleep and then they wake up at three o'clock in the morning and they've still got a bucket load of that on board and they want to go for a wee or something then that there are also risks inherent in that the other risk i guess is that a lot of medicines for sleep can people can tolerate to them so they need more to get the same effect that might not be a big deal depending on the stage of the illness so I'm not going to give you a blank. I'm not going to give you a specific answer to that question. It's more like need a proper sleep assessment. Be a little bit wary about meds. Be aware that the regulation of the 24 hour clock is something that is intrinsically probably affected in HD in itself. But also the inactivity messes up your sleep, as we all know. So is it... Is it wrong to, to suggest that somebody with Huntington's disease, particularly as their disease progresses, would be expected to go to bed and stay in bed and sleep like, like somebody who doesn't have Huntington's? Or would it be more, um, more likely that they'd have sleeps during the day or, to, uh, you know, at a number of intervals? That's a really, I mean, I, I, I do genuinely think that. It's hard to prove um, that uh, as the disease progresses, certainly, and sleep patterns get really... Um, sort of out of whack, then I think it's, 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 it is hard to expect that somebody would go back into, a, you know, in quotes, normal sleep pattern. So actually it's about structuring the care so that when the person's up, they can have care and do something. And when they're asleep, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't always fit in with everybody's life, does it? That's the, so I guess we're putting sleep patterns. The whole of our society is sort of constructed to fit in with certain sleep patterns. But that's not the poor person with HD's fault, is it? But it yeah. does make it hard. So you're really looking to focus around the person rather than the kind of what's considered to be normal behavior. You adapt to the person's change yeah. of routine and try and work around it. Yeah, and that's easy for me to say, but you know, if you've got to get kids to school and you've got a job to do because you're the only one that's making the, and there's no extra care coming in. Yeah, it's it tricky. Causes really difficult problems. Okay, with one final question for you, Hugh. Um, I'm finding it really difficult to be isolated since COVID. Mm -hmm. How can I stay positive? And I think the likelihood is that we're going to see more restrictions on movement um, in Northern Ireland, certainly. And we've got some people in supported accommodation who aren't able to go outside. Um, so how do you keep motivated? And how do you keep positive in situations where, where you're limited on what you can do or who you can see? Do you think this is people with HD or do you think this is their spouses or care, care primary carers or a bit of both? Mm. It could be either, I suppose. Maybe you could just think about it in the general terms and then look at HD yeah. specifically, if that's okay. Yeah, I think probably simple and gentle routine. And uh, in a way, some people with HD have managed lockdown really well because that whole idea about thinking about the future, what you're going to do next week, next year, next month, it sort of goes out of the window a bit and we're all doing that a bit aren't we They're like okay let's set up a simple routine and just do that from day to day mm -hmm. i feel like i've been doing that anyway in a, in a certainly in the early days march and april and we may have to go back to that again is that every day is a bit like groundhog day 
but it's sort of learning to accept that it is an okay thing. So we'll, I guess setting a routine and doing certain things at certain times and just getting into the idea of, okay, we just got to hunker down here, wait for the storm to pass and do regular things at regular times. So kind of go with the flow. Yeah, I think so. Acceptance. Okay. Is, again, not easy, is it? No. And what about, is there anything specific for people with Huntington's you might consider there during COVID? Um, no, I think it's, it's, it applies even more so to people with HD, but in a, some, in a funny sort of way, a lot of people with HD find that a little bit easier to have simple and regular routines. Yeah. That's the other thing is that for the spouses, if they're in a situation where the partner is changing in their personality and, and they've got no, uh, their usual support mechanisms aren't present, it's about how to set up good support mechanisms with so you know alongside the distancing measures so that's maybe exploring other options and I guess you know, maybe H, H Danny can help with that it's like well how do you get carer supports mm. in a time of lockdown whether that's over the video and then older people are sometimes less tech savvy it's about you know even yeah, the, trying to adapt trying to adapt if you can yeah to zoom calls and it's the same thing we're all doing isn't it I guess no, Have just, you um, come across any situations where people become more um, anxious or frustrated because they can't leave the house as such, or you know, kind of you like cabin fever? I suppose you'd nearly describe yeah, it. Yeah, and also with an HD, sometimes you know there are a bunch of people who go, "I want to go to the shops. I'm just going to the shops." Yeah, they they partly because they're frustrated, but also partly because they can't see the bigger picture. picture. Yeah, again, that's that's hard and we we're, we've had a few cases like that since lockdown and we just have to manage each one in a sort of multidisciplinary way so you don't want to massively impinge on a person's freedom but at the same time you need to try and manage the risk and each situation probably requires its own solution I think. Okay uh, Hugh we'll leave it at that and um, there's a there's a few um, questions around uh, specific drugs and things like that you might recommend that people look at uh, so we'll follow that up by email uh, okay. if i can ask um if i can ask jimmy to to join us for a few minutes and maybe share his thoughts uh, you've been listening to hugh there um jimmy would you like to introduce yourself uh, for those who don't know what a hd expert you are well i have hd experience i claim no expertise um i'm an old friend of the association northern ireland um, and uh, that's about it. But uh, just a couple of comments on uh, what Dr. Ricards, my teacher and friend, said. First of all, I have a vow to myself never to let an opportunity pass without uh, mentioning access. So I just want to underline, highlight, and scream about this notion of access to drugs. They're not going to be growing on trees, and they're not going to give them away. And I would just say that for all of the things people worry about, about their families, individual family members, the future that lies ahead, all of that's gonna change in an instant once uh, uh, effective drugs are available. And it's gonna get narrower, I would bet. And it's gonna narrow down to how do I get this drug for this person that I love in my life. So, most, a lot of people out there will say, well, Jesus, we don't even have a drug yet. Relax, chill, man. You know, let, one thing at a time. But that linear sequential thing doesn't make a lot of sense. The time is now to start doing it, to start speaking up about it, or at least as Dr. Ricardo was saying, asking the question or saying the word access. Um, because uh, it's going to be a worldwide problem. Here in the States, our healthcare system is radically different than yours. But it's gonna, this is going to be a universal problem. And uh, I try to get people to consider all of the hassles they might have had with their healthcare systems or their insurance systems or anything they've done to have to advocate for their family members. Think of it as a warm-up for what is about to come. So... Again, it's a personal vow not to let this opportunity to ever address this topic pass. So that's all.
Jimmy that's frozen, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, he was just getting going as well. Um, he might be able to rejoin us. Just give him a sec because he's joined us from the States. So he's been sitting up early waiting for us. <laughs> so hopefully he can come back to us. Um, I, I could take a couple more questions in the meantime, if you want. Uh, let me see. He's going to come here. Uh, hi, Jimmy. Can you hear us? Back now. He's point out on the memory thing that sometimes uh, if you're not really uh, versed in how uh, process of people's processing delays or how you can make processing quicker by how you ask questions, people may make an easy assumption that it's a memory loss when in fact it may not be. That's it. A pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, I'll follow up with you afterwards because I want to touch base with you about um, your resource, Hurry Up and Wait, which is fantastic. And I think we need to get some more copies of that. OK, um, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us. As I said, I'm going to be following up afterwards with some um, email resources and a collation of those questions and answers and our video from today. We really appreciate you taking the time. And the more people who understand the condition, I think the better it will be for patients and carers throughout Northern Ireland. So thank you very much. And we'll speak to you soon. Bye.